You know, you mentioned the uh, American Legal Institute. Mm -hmm. in American Law Institute. Law Institute, I'm yes. sorry. American Law Institute forming in 1923 and yes. how they're responsible for the uh, model penal code. code. Is that right? right. But, and I want to ask, um, because with some of these things that we're talking about, the first, the, the first thing I think about going back that far, 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution, mm -hmm. Vladimir Lenin, one of the things he wanted to do was to abolish the family. And one of the right. first things he did, for example, in Bolshevik Russia is that he <clears throat> created a law for unilateral no-fault divorce because mm -hmm. uh, it, th there were a number of factors back there, but, right. it, but he knew that he had to destroy the family, to abolish the family, um, to be consistent with communistic <clears throat> thought, right. and also to um, weaken the entire societal structure so that he could impose this type of a new system, new morality or new immorality, mm -hmm. um, in which the state would have more and more control right. over people. Right. Now, and I'm just wondering, um, did, are any of these same factors or any of these same thoughts uh, was there an influence from what Bolshevik, what was happening with Lenin under Bolshevik Russia and what was happening with the American Law Institute? Yes, um, well, to go back to also to what Lenin said, Lenin also said that America would never be overturned by Bolshevik type revolution or, or you know, that, that type of um, um, uh, war, but rather that undermining the morality of America, uh, undermining our patriotism, uh, and our spiritual life, those three things, if they can be undermined, then America can collapse with, from within. Um, but uh, Samuel Adams said the same thing. The signer of the Declaration of Independence said that um, morality was critical. Uh, and, you know, once that was compromised, if the people lost their virtue, they'd be ready to surrender to the first internal or external invader. So I always say morality is a national security issue. And I say that we're, that is we're, very under, good. Yeah. we're under more attack from that, and, and that's a bigger threat than ISIS ever is to yeah. America. Well, that is tremendous. I, I like the way that you phrased it like that. Um, and I, I don't know where I want to go first, but let me ask something. We were talking about being here and right. the church just starting to address some of these issues, yes. but there's also <laughs> some shortfalls. Right. Um, tell, tell me what the shortfalls are that you're seeing. Well, we're not done with the conference yet. Okay. But, okay. <laughs> so I, I okay. Yeah. But I will say what I have not seen yet is we're not addressing the elephant in the room. Why do we have this explosion of abuse? Which, again, if we go back mm -hmm. to the 1960s with the sexual revolution, um, statistics were kept for all you know, be prior to that even right. uh, about sex abuse, about teen pregnancy, about um, uh, teen STDs, and we saw a across the board when we looked at the statistics that once we put sex education in the schools, that's when we saw this dramatic increase of STDs, uh, this dramatic increase of pregnancy, um, sex abuse of children exploded, um, but it also correlates with pornography. Uh, right. And those are the, the elephant is in the room is sex education and pornography. By the way, sex education is childhood pornography. Um, oh, absolutely. Yes, it's abuse. Which most it's, it's people don't perversion. realize. It's, yeah. um, and so because sex education grooms a child yeah. for sex abuse, sex education um, can also cause a child to act out on what they hear and what they see. So we're talking a lot today at the conference about peer-on-peer uh, -peer abuse. Um, so sex education has become a huge um, threat to, right. to children and uh, we really have to wake up to that issue. So one thing I'd like to ask you about this as well, but when you look at some of the research that has been done, some of the research in itself was almost sexual abuse. Um, yes. Well, Kinsey's research right. was definitely sexual abuse. He interviewed pedophiles who raped children. And um, he actually, in his book, which his book is in every library, um, it, his, his science, <laughs> it's not really science, uh, was taught, is taught, uh, it's the foundation for human sexuality courses that are mm -hmm. taught 
in Christian universities as well as secular okay. universities, sad to say. Um, but in his book, he has a table, Table 34, and it documents how many orgasms does a child have. And he starts at five months old up to 14 years of age. Uh, some of these children, he's documenting how many orgasms do they have in a 24-hour period of time. Right. And, and I mean, how so would wrap he, your you know, head around that? Yeah. What, what's going on there? Yeah. So my, my question is, did he normalize abuse? And perversion. Yes, what he said was that um, incest, that sex abuse of children, was not abuse at all. He mm -hmm. said children are sexual from birth. Mm -hmm. What he meant by that was that infants can have sex with adults and it is not harmful. Mm -hmm. The whole rape culture, he said that rape is a myth. Mm -hmm. uh, he said if we looked at the 90% of all men in America, which back then the men were in World War II, um, he said they would all be considered rapists according to his data, but for his mm -hmm. male data, he went into the prisons and he sought out the most sexually deviant criminal right. and said this is the typical sexual behavior yeah. of the American male. Yeah, so, if you take a group that is... Yeah. <laughs> it's a little bias. A little, it's a little? not science. <laughs> no, it's, it's not it's science. It's subjective, not objective at all. <laughs>